At its core, chromatography is a technique used to separate out the components of a mixture. This isn't always as easy as it seems. If we have a beaker containing a solution with an unknown number of unknown compounds dissolved into it, how can we go about identifying what's in there? The most basic form of chromatography is paper chromatography. You've probably done this experiment yourself at school at some point. Let's have a quick reminder of how it works, because the principles involved here are exactly the same for more sophisticated types of chromatography. With paper chromatography, we take a piece of chromatography paper and we draw a pencil line across the bottom to act as our start line. On that line, we place dots of the inks we're analysing. We then suspend the paper in a solvent, making sure that the top of the solvent is below our inks. Over time, the solvent soaks up the paper and we can see the different dyes in the inks separate out. Now, why does this happen? You probably originally learned that this was related to the solubility of the different dyes in the solvent. The more soluble the dye, the further it moves with the solvent. This is true, but we can give this a more general explanation that will hold true for all other types of chromatography. Let's imagine we have two immiscible liquids, an organic layer and an aqueous layer. Immiscible means they don't mix together, like oil and water. If we mix in a solute of some kind, the solute will always have a greater affinity for one solvent over the other, depending on the intermolecular forces it can form with the solvent molecules. This means it will dissolve more in one of the liquids compared to the other. This separation will also happen if our two phases are a liquid and an adsorbent solid, or a liquid and a gas, or an adsorbent solid and a gas. The solutes will bind to one more strongly than the other. No matter what the two phases are, the solute is partitioned between the two phases. It will establish a dynamic equilibrium between the two phases, whereby the rate at which it moves from one phase into the other will be equal to the rate at which it moves back. Just like any equilibrium, we can establish an equilibrium constant, which we call the partition coefficient. Coming back to our paper chromatography, there are two phases that the dye molecules can interact with here, the paper and the solvent. The paper is still, so we call it the stationary phase, and the solvent is moving, so we call it the mobile phase. Any given molecule in these mixtures will interact with both the stationary phase and the mobile phase. However, they'll each have different affinities for each phase and will be partitioned between them accordingly. If a given molecule binds more strongly to the stationary phase than it does to the mobile phase, it won't move as far. If another molecule binds more strongly to the mobile phase than it does to the stationary phase, it'll move further. So, relative affinity to the stationary phase and to the mobile phase is what separates, or partitions, the components in the mixture. Once they're separated, we can measure the retention factor, RF, of each component. This is given by distance moved by the spot divided by distance moved by the solvent. The RF values allow us to compare chromatograms that might have been left for different amounts of time. Even if the spots had a chance to move further, the RF value should remain constant. We can also compare RF values to those of known compounds to help identify the components in our mixture. Now, a more sophisticated form of paper chromatography is thin layer chromatography, or TLC. This follows the exact same principles as before, except that the stationary phase is a thin layer of alumina or silica which has been coated onto a plate of glass, metal or plastic. The alumina or silica thin film is polar, with OH groups at the surface so it can form hydrogen bonds and dipole-dipole interactions with the molecules passing over it. This means it will bind more strongly to polar molecules than it will to non-polar molecules. Apart from that, TLC works in the same way as paper chromatography. The mixtures are dotted onto the pencil line, the plate is suspended in a solvent, and over time, the spots move up the film. Just like with paper chromatography, we can measure RF values. However, another useful feature of TLC is that the stationary phase can often be made to fluoresce under UV light. This is particularly useful if the spots from our mixture can't be seen under visible light. We can shine UV light on the plate and watch it fluoresce. The regions which are obscured by the spots from our mixture will appear darker than the rest of the plate. Alternatively, we can spray the plate with a separate dye that can make our spots easier to see. Another useful feature of TLC is that, unlike chromatography paper, TLC plates can be washed and reused.
However, what if we wanted to properly separate a mixture so that we ended up with separate solutions of each component? Maybe we want to quantify the amount of each component as well. It would be very difficult to do all this with TLC, since we use such small quantities and since there's no good way to accurately transfer the spots to a solution. For quantitative chromatography of larger quantities, we would use column chromatography. With column chromatography, we'd use a glass column which has a tap at the bottom, very similar to a burette. First, we place a bit of cotton wool at the bottom with a thin layer of sand on top to prevent the stationary phase from getting into the tap. We then pack the column with the same material that's used as the stationary phase for TLC, alumina, or more commonly, silica. To do this, we create a slurry of silica with a solvent and pour it into the column. The silica will settle at the bottom. How do we know what solvent to use for column chromatography? For that, we can quickly run a few tests using TLC to see which solvents best separate the components of our mixture. It's important to ensure that the silica is kept wet at all times, so the solvent level will need to be continually topped up. If the solvent drops below the top of the silica, the silica can dry out, leading to cracking and poor separation. To protect the silica, we place another layer of sand on top. Now we'll be able to top up the solvent without worrying about messing up our horizontal levels. If the layers become uneven, the components won't separate out evenly. Underneath the column, we'll place a test tube or a flask, depending on how big the column is. We'll need to have several empty test tubes nearby so that we can swap them out once the current test tube gets filled up. Before we load our mixture, we'll need to let some solvent out so that the level is around the top of the sand layer. Now, we'll gently drop a solution of our mixture on top using a pipette, pouring it all around the edge of the column to create an even layer on top of the sand layer. We can also wash around the inside of the column using a little bit more solvent to make sure none of the mixture is left on the glass. Now, we'll gently open the tap to allow the mixture to settle at the top of the silica layer. Once this is all settled at the top of the silica, we can close the tap and gently top up the solvent layer so that there's plenty to work with and we're ready to start separating. With the tap open, running into the test tube below, the solvent will start to pour out, causing our mixture to move down as well. As one test tube fills up, we'll close the tap and switch it out for an empty test tube, then open the tap again. It's important to remember to keep topping up the solvent so that the silica doesn't dry out. The different components in the mixture will have different affinities for the stationary silica phase and the mobile solvent phase. More polar molecules in the mixture will be more strongly attracted to the polar silica, and hence they won't move as fast. More non-polar molecules in the mixture will be less attracted to the polar silica and will move faster. Over time, the different components will separate out. These different components will end up in different test tubes. TLC can be used to check that each test tube only contains one component. We can also get more sophisticated types of column chromatography which have a detector fitted to the outlet. This can produce a chromatogram which shows peaks when each component passes through the detector. The time taken for a component to pass all the way through the column is called the retention time. Comparing the retention time of an unknown component with that of a known compound which has been run under the same conditions can help to identify it. A more advanced form of column chromatography is high-performance liquid chromatography, or HPLC. Rather than relying on gravity, this involves pumping a solvent mobile phase through a thin column that has been packed with a silica stationary phase. Using a polar stationary phase like this is called normal phase HPLC, and we typically use a non-polar solvent such as hexane as the mobile phase. The silica can also be coated with non-polar hydrocarbons. In this case, we typically use a more polar solvent such as methanol as the mobile phase. This is called reverse phase HPLC. Either way, we inject a solution of our mixture into the high-pressure solvent stream and the components of the mixture are separated by their relative affinities to the stationary phase and to the mobile phase. Since high pressures are required to force the solvent through the column, HPLC is sometimes called high-pressure liquid chromatography. The high pressures make HPLC a lot faster than column chromatography. Each component is detected as it makes its way out of the column. The most common type of detector used with HPLC is a UV absorbance detector. This involves passing a beam of UV light through the solvent as it exits the column. A detector opposite measures the intensity of UV light that makes it through the solvent. 
As a compound in the mixture flows in front of the UV detector, it will absorb some of the UV radiation, so the detector measures a decrease in UV intensity, giving us a peak. Just like with column chromatography, we can end up with a chromatogram which shows the retention time of the different components. And we can compare our retention times to those of known compounds that have been run under the same conditions to identify the components in our sample. Column chromatography and HPLC are both great techniques, but what if we're more interested in a gas phase mixture? For that, we'd use gas chromatography. Gas chromatography uses a long, thin column which is packed with a solid such as silica which can act as the stationary phase. Alternatively, the solid can act as a support for a non-volatile, unreactive liquid siloxane polymer which can act as the stationary phase instead. The column can be up to 100 meters long and is coiled inside a computer-controlled oven. An inert carrier gas such as argon, helium or nitrogen continuously flows through the column and acts as the mobile phase. At the end, there will be a detector of some kind. There are two common types of detector used for gas chromatography. The first is a flame ionization detector, or FID, which contains a small flame that can bust each component that passes through it. This forms ions, which are attracted to electrodes, resulting in a small current which is detected to give a peak. The second type of detector is a mass spectrometer, which I'll go into more in another video. There are many ways to prepare a sample with gas chromatography. Our mixture can be a gas, a volatile solution, or even an extract of the headspace above a volatile solution. No matter what our sample is, we first inject a small amount of it into the injector oven. This is a smaller oven located before the main column oven. The injector oven is set to a high temperature, usually between 200 to 300 degrees C. This ensures our sample vaporizes so that the carrier gas can transport it into the column. The column oven usually starts off at much lower temperatures, so much of our sample will often condense back into a liquid as soon as it enters the column. Now, the computer-controlled column oven will gradually increase its temperature over a set amount of time. Let's say it increases from 30 degrees C to 200 degrees C over the course of 30 minutes. One by one, as each component in the mixture reaches its boiling point, they will evaporate, allowing the carrier gas to push them through the column. This is similar to separation via fractional distillation. However, an advantage with gas chromatography is that if two components have similar boiling points, gas chromatography can further separate them based on their affinity to the mobile and stationary phases. Again, just like with column chromatography and HPLC, with gas chromatography, we can end up with a chromatogram which shows the retention time of the different components, which we can compare to those of known compounds that have been run under the same conditions to identify the components in our sample. An important thing to note with any type of chromatography that involves a detector is that the detector will often respond differently to different compounds. So how can we quantify the amount of a given component in our mixture? For that, we'll need to use a calibration curve. Let's say we've identified that one of our components is butyl propanoate, based on its retention time. But we want to figure out the concentration of butyl propanoate in our original sample. We'd need to prepare several different solutions of butyl propanoate, each with a different concentration. We then perform chromatography on each solution. We should see that each solution produces a peak at the same retention time, but with higher concentrations, the detector response will increase. The type of response depends on the type of detector, but let's just call it peak area for now. By plotting concentration against peak area, we should get a straight line. This is our calibration curve. Now, by finding the area of the butyl propanoate peak in our original sample, we can simply go across to our line and then down to find the concentration of butyl propanoate. So, as we've seen, chromatography is a very powerful and very versatile separation technique with a wide range of applications. If you found this video helpful, please consider subscribing to support the channel and let me know in the comments if you have any questions.